African agricultural trade, a great topic to follow the one that we just concluded. So those of you who want to talk to this panel group that just exited the stage, let's wait till this group is done for that to occur. So if I could have the next panel out here, and I'll provide a brief introduction to Jennifer Blanke. Um, Jennifer is Vice President of Agriculture, Human, and Social Development for the African Development Bank. She previously served as Chief Economist at the World Economic F Forum. She holds a master's degree in international affairs from Columbia University, uh, additional degrees in international economics from Geneva, and presently a member of the Canadian government's Council on Economic Growth. So a great topic here to think about and talk about technologies for African agricultural trade. Jennifer? Thank you. Thanks a lot. So my name is Jennifer Blanca, as you heard, and I'm Vice President for Agriculture, Human and Social Development at the African Development Bank, and we're very pleased to be here today to be talking to you about something that we announced really for the first time publicly exactly here a year ago, which is uh, Technologies for Africa's Agricultural Transformation. Uh, and we promised last year that we would come back and give an update and tell you what we'd done, and so that's what we're doing. Uh, and we're very excited because we actually have made quite a bit of progress. Uh, and in a partnership like this, which is new, uh, that's not to be underestimated. Uh, so very happy for that. What I'm going to do is I'll quickly introduce the panel. Then I'm just going to show you very few slides so that everyone's up to speed on what we are talking about. Uh, and then we'll get to the panel. And I'm hoping that we'll have time for some Q&A at the end. I think all of the speakers will stay somewhat brief to give you your chance to speak afterwards. So um, I'm here joined by many of our partners in crime in TAT and in agriculture in general. So I'll just introduce them uh, from left to right, and I, I think that you'll know pretty much everybody on the panel uh, very well. Uh, there's Teranya Sengenga, uh, who is uh, the DG of IITA and a very important player uh, in uh, everything that we're doing around TAT. We then have Roy Steiner, uh, who's managing director at the Rockefeller Foundation, and as everyone knows, Rockefeller has been critical in driving technologies in the agriculture space for decades. Uh, after that, we have, of course, Professor Ruth Ornyango, uh, who, uh, after many different things, uh, is now the chair of the board of Sasakawa Africa Foundation, among other things. Uh, we have Lawrence Kent, uh, who is the senior program officer at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, also a really critical partner uh, in this effort. And finally, and I think who needs no introduction, uh, but President Obasanjo, uh, the former president of Nigeria, and also a great friend of the African Development Bank and someone who will bring to this group uh, and this panel uh, a lot of wisdom, particularly in terms of what we need to get from the government uh, and what the government's role is in driving out technology. So let me quick, quickly just present a few slides to you, um, because I mostly want uh, to listen to the panel, uh, just to let you know what we're trying to do uh, through uh, TAT. So just going back to why we launched it in the first place, uh, and this is something we've been discussing quite a bit uh, here over the last couple of days, agriculture is critical to Africa. Uh, it is employing upwards of 70% of the population uh, and really is at the center and at the core of African societies and yet does not contribute significantly to GDP in most cases. Productivity has not kept up with GDP, let alone uh, uh, population growth. And so this is something uh, that is a real challenge. And yet at the same time, there's a massive opportunity because we have rising middle class, rising urbanization. People are demanding more and more high quality food processed food. This is all about moving up the value chain. Uh, and this is something that African economies can do uh, if we get the right technologies out there. Right now, you know, you can see the opportunity in the billions, more than 35 billion at this point, net imports that Africa uh, is seeing every year. And that will, if we don't do anything, go up much higher. Uh, and in fact, the opportunity is so huge. If you look at some estimates, by 2030, the food market uh, in Africa will be about a trillion dollars. Uh, and so this is a huge opportunity if we can overcome the challenge. 
And I won't belabor the challenge too much, but if you look at productivity rates, uh, as you can see on this uh, slide, uh, Africa, Africa's, uh, and Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, uh, uh, productivity rates in agriculture have remained very low while the rest of the world has taken off. Uh, so, you know, why is this? I mean, at the, the bottom line is that the technologies that are needed are just not getting to farmers at scale. And so this is what TAT is aiming to do. It's basically taking those technologies off the shelf that exist and getting them to farmers at scale. Green revolutions have happened around the world. And today, there are more technologies than there were during those green revolutions, and yet it's not happened yet in Africa. So the goal here is to foster that green revolution uh, in Africa. Uh, and in particular, given that we're talking about 54 economies, many of them small economies, it's about taking a regional approach, an ag um, agroecological approach, so that we're rolling out uh, the different uh, technologies across the zones, rather than having to go through approval processes in every individual country. Now, very importantly, it's a partnership. It brings together all the CG centers, uh, the NARS. Uh, it brings together seed companies and all of that in terms of distribution, but also, very importantly, all of the donors uh, and the governments. And you see this here, and this is not even exhaustive. Um, now, it's tricky, and that's some of what we're going to be talking about, because getting all of these uh, different organizations with their own institutional uh, needs and, and, um, and expectations uh, is challenging, and yet it's worth it if you can get everybody working together. In terms of what we've done, and we're going to hear a bit more about this now, we are developing what we call compacts for either uh, staple crops, you know, rice, maize, etc., or highly nutritious crops, beans, uh, uh, orange flesh sweet potato, uh, and so on and so forth, and also some enabling factors, things like soil and water, uh, and making sure that we are deciding centrally what are, using the best expertise, and it's really across uh, different sectors, what are the best technologies that we should drive out and then driving them out together. We're working in 31 countries already, uh, and we're just starting uh, to really get uh, this out uh, into the fields now. I just wanted to um, spend one last moment mentioning the fact that, in general, this is really about getting the latest technologies for productivity enhancement and production, but it's also about fighting pests. Uh, and we've been deploying this most recently, uh, and it's been a really good uh, effort and experiment for us uh, to fight the fall armyworm, which one of, many of you have heard about. We've been talking about this, uh, and, and the, the alarm was really sounded last year when we were here. Uh, and this is all about the fact that pests also don't respect borders. And so how do you make sure that you can quickly get the right kinds of pest-resistant uh, either you know, pesticides, but also the right kinds of crops out very quickly to the fields? And this is something that we started in earnest. Uh, we're basically about to reach 15 million farmers in southern Africa this year. Our goal is to reach about 50 billion overall throughout Africa uh, when we go to the other regions next year. And so finally, really, what do we hope is going to come out of this? Uh, it's that we're going to massively increase productivity because we're getting everybody to work together in a different way to get those technologies out there. We're going to massively increase the production. We're going to be able to feed Africa and help Africa to feed the world and uh, you know, not inconsequentially create a lot of jobs in the process, which is something we know is so critical in Africa and good jobs. So with that, um, I think we get a sense of, of what we're trying to do. I think I want to now turn to the panel and hear a bit more detail. And particularly, I'd like to start with Dr. Sanginga because IITA is really at the core of what we're trying to do in terms of helping us to coordinate all of this. So given, you know, obviously your role now, but especially your expertise over the years, what is it that will make all of this a success? Yeah, <clears throat> well, uh, thank you, Jennifer. Um, yeah, uh, you said very well that uh, this is not about uh, pilot uh, experiment, it's about scaling up uh, the successful technologies that we have so they get in hand uh, of uh, the farmers. I was just going to give you an example of a seed system in Africa. And uh, you could see how the mindset change has prevented really agriculture from moving uh, very, very much in Africa. So in Nigeria, before 2011, agriculture was uh, just a kind of social activity. And uh, depending on aid, 
if you take the penetration of seed system in Nigeria was below 30%, for example. And you can give a lot of reason for that. Even a government was waiting for donors' money uh, to do agriculture. And um, if you count the number of companies, seed company during that period, with less than 10 companies producing very poor seed quality and so on. In 2011, we had uh, a new minister who was uh, quite uh, young, who the first decision he took was to change the mindset. And the motto in Nigeria in 2011 was uh, agriculture is a business. It's, it has got to scale and it's to, to reach as many people as uh, we could. Simply changing the mindset, a lot of things change in Nigeria. The first thing he did was uh, basically to stop uh, corruption fertilizers and seed system. He removed the government from that business and uh, he invited the private sector to come in. In three years, the number of seed company uh, changed from 10 to almost 100. Uh, the adoption, just to take an example of rice, uh, in uh, the middle part of Nigeria, uh, basically moved the seed system moved there from 30 to 60%. And Nigeria stopped importing almost 50% of um, uh, the rice that we be, just be, be importing. It was purely a change of mindset where the farmer was not waiting anymore for aid or NGO to come and give seed. They took value of uh, basically of uh, the resources and the money they could get from uh, just commercializing this agriculture. I think that's just an example of what is happening on the continent for the moment. And uh, one of uh, the obstacles basically has been technologies. Certainly, we still use what all technology and that is identifying all the technologies that uh, can make a difference. Uh, basically, take them to the private sector and the uh, hand of um, uh, the, the farmer. Uh, this program has reached, started almost one year ago, and uh, we see already the change uh, of the mindset of the government. And just to give you an example, the president of Togo wants to imitate uh, President of Basanjo and create an uh, initiative on cassava, presidential initiative on cassava. He called us to go and help him. But, but what was very interesting, when we were discussing with farmers, the farmers discovered that the variety of cassava they were using, they were very old, low yielding, almost nine tons instead of getting 25 tons. But they realized that in Nigeria, there are some varieties which give triple the yield. And the role of that has been, as a matter of fact, picking some of those varieties which are so successful in Nigeria and transfer them to Togo. And uh, those varieties are being tested in Togo. So really, uh, in summary, that um, is also about the mindset change, where agriculture basically become a business, become profitable, and uh, bring money in the um, hands of farmers. Great, yeah. thanks. So all about changing the narrative, changing the mindset, agriculture as a business, not as a way of life. So Roy, turning to you, because um, Rockefeller's been very involved in this area for a long time. And uh, I think has put a lot of, we were just discussing this before, has been putting a lot of the finance in that we're basically building on now. So given the experience and also your previous experience, what do you think will really make it possible to scale these technologies quickly, you know, getting them to the farmers? What would make this whole effort successful mm. in a nutshell? Uh, that's a simple question. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you so much. I thought I would t share a little bit about YieldWise, which is uh, the effort by the Rockefeller Foundation to reduce food loss and food waste. And we've put quite a bit of uh, resources into that. But some of the lessons that have come out of that 
is that it's, as every, I think most people in this room know, it's an ecosystem. You, have to, you can't just do one thing, you have to do multiple things at the same time. So it's not just farmer aggregation or technology or finance or policy, it's multiple things at the same time. But underlying that, I mean, I, one of the keys is to really understand what the farmers want and what they need. And um, you know, uh, at the Amidia Network, uh, Rockefeller and Gates, we've been starting to use uh, Acumen's funds, lean data, um, to really to do these very quick five-question uh, uh, surveys of farmers to help understand where to go and what to change. What's amazing about this is that people think they know what farmers want and need, and they actually don't. And so it got to the point where we actually asked the, the, the leaders of the this different initiatives, what do you think your farmers are going to reply? And then, and they, they, they take a guess, and then we compare it to reality. And it's always something is different. There's always a surprise. And, and so that for, what, I, what I like about that is that it, you have to be open and be humble and be listening. And uh, the, the, one of the uh, examples of that is we've been promoting these PICS bags, pr the Purdue Hermetically Sealed uh, Storage Bags. And the, my, the, 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 the folks who are, who are running the program, they, oh, you're do, the, you market this bag using um, the fact that it's gonna reduce the amount of loss. That's the most important thing. But it turns out that what was most important for the farmers, uh, especially the women farmers, was the fact that you didn't have to put chemicals into the, into the grain, and so they, they knew that that was more healthy. And so actually changing the marketing from, oh, you're gonna save, to actually, this is healthier for you and your family, that drove uh, sales of that bag, right? And so these little tweaks are, to have rapid feedback all along is absolutely essential if you wanna scale, because there isn't, you have to be doing many things at the same time well. Um, the other thing that is, I think, incredibly exciting that enables scale now that we really didn't even have five or 10 years ago were all these new financing mechanisms that we can now use mobile networks. And, and that's getting better and better because so much of the things that require transformation require capital and so far smallholder farmers have not been able to afford that. But now with these new financial instruments and leasing and all of, I think there's, there's a lot of exciting opportunities there. And then of course there's policy on top of that which, uh, people here could talk a lot more about. So I'll, I'll stop there. Great, so complexity, uh, also the importance of efficiency. And by the way, on the new mobile technologies, as we've seen in Nigeria, and as, as, as Dr. Sanginga mentioned, it's also about rooting out corruption. So it's quite amazing what some of these new technologies, how many birds you can kill with one stone, so to speak. So Ruth, tell us. I mean, you, we've been discussing, I think, TAT for some time. Mm -hmm. Uh, and it would be great to hear from you what you think Sasakawa could do. You know, I mean, you've been working so much in extension and training and all these issues throughout Africa. You have one of the biggest networks. How do you see Sasakawa really being involved in INTAT uh, and enabling uh, all of these technologies, uh, not only to get to farmers, but also to be used by them properly? Yeah, thank you, Jennifer. I was here just an hour ago, by the way. I'm sure they are tired of looking at me. But I think you, but, have, a um, you have a different dress on now, Ruth. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, just uh, I, I say um, I, I feel so happy to have our elder statesman, uh, President Obasanjo, here on the panel with us. And to say that he actually served on the Sasakawa board mm -hmm. even before I joined the board. So he was a board member even as president. Mm -hmm. And that for those who don't know, Sasakawa was established uh, in 1986, following the 1984-85 famine that killed nearly a million Ethiopians. And Ethiopia said, never again. And so Sasakawa was created by late Roichi Sasakawa, by still living President Jimmy Carter, and Dr. Norman Bollock. So that's why we come here every year. And Japan, Nippon Foundation has been supporting us consistently every year since 1986. So that's why I talk of long term. It's not as much money as I know some of you use in this room, but it has been consistent. 
It's been long term. We know the farmer. We understand the farmer. We work with the government of the day. You know, we went to Ethiopia when nobody thought Ethiopia would work. Ethiopia now is able to export maize, even to my own Kenya. They are not in Kenya, so we import maize from them. So what have we been doing? Technologies. Technologies exist. Roy, you know that from the Rockefeller Foundation. Technologies exist. Sanginga, you know that. They sit on shelves. They sit in papers. We continue to do research, and they just sit there. But we don't use those technologies. We have the answers. For goodness sake, we have the answers. So that's what we are good at as Sasakawa. We are not in every country, but where we are, we are very good. And Dr. Bolov will arrive, and he goes to the farmer. While you are going on with niceties and being, you know, celebrities, he, you, where is he? He was the farmer, smallholder farmers. They quadrupled maize yield, sorghum yield. Yeah, Dr. Gebisa there can attest to that. It was quadrupled. We know how to increase yields. We have the technology. Now the issue was how do we process it through the value chain? So the issue of processing, storing, you know, having uh, technologies of, of, of fabrication, of, of uh, machinery, we have had all that. So even as Sasakawa, we have the answers, by the way. We just need more money. <laughs> we need more money. We need more partnership to reach more countries. I hope everybody's listening. And, <laughs> and especially Dr. Borlaug is listening. You know? And actually, we can do it. So we want to be a part of this. And also, we have the extension arm, which is Sasakawa Africa Association for Extension Education, where we upgrade the skills of the extension workers, those who have been on the ground for a long time. Because things keep changing all the time. And especially with the new technology, with ICT, we would like to go into e-extension, but only where it can work. It doesn't mean it can work everywhere. But at the end of the day, we know our farmer. Our farmer is our friend, and we can achieve by so doing. Yeah. So resonating with what Roy said, which is you need to listen. You need to know what they need. Don't assume you know what the farmer needs. So Lawrence, turning to you. Um, Bill and Melinda Gates' his foundation is very involved with TAD, uh, funding directly, obviously, the clearinghouse and really that that group that is deciding on the technologies uh, and working very closely with Dr. Senginga. So given your experience on that, you know, wh what do you think it will take to make this work? And also, how does it link to the other work that you're doing in this area at the foundation? Well, the Gates Foundation Agriculture Program really sets as its goal country-led inclusive agricultural transformation. And increasingly, I think we've, we've come to the realization that if we want things, innovations, uh, change to happen at scale, we really need to engage with both the government and private sector. Traditionally, the Gates Foundation, uh, Roy and I were in the trenches together for many years. Uh, we funded a lot of good uh, research programs, and uh, a lot of them at CGR centers. And we learned that it's actually pretty easy to give a grant to a CGR center Dr. Singingas, for example, or Simit or Erie, to do good research, to create some innovations, some breakthroughs. But then the hard part comes into dissemination. And then who can do the dissemination? Who's good at doing dissemination at scale? And I think we've sort of come to the conclusion that ultimately it has to be either the private sector or the government has to engage in that dissemination process. And products have to be designed in a participatory way with, with that in mind for them to really go to scale. So a lot of innovations have come out of Gates Foundation's investments in great organizations like IITA and CIMIT and the NARS and ERIE, et cetera. Things like improved technologies for weed management in, in cassava that, that uh, President Obasanjo and I were discussing earlier that can make a huge difference. Things in uh, mechanization, uh, biofortification, improved varieties that are stress resistant and higher nutrition. 
Uh, many interesting, promising breakthroughs, but then how do we get them deployed at scale? I think TAT is, is part of the answer. Because if something is going to be truly country-led and country government-led, TAT is an opportunity for those countries to tap into loan money from the African Development Bank and then tap into the technical expertise that's available through the TAT clearinghouse to help design programs on the country level that are funded through African Development uh, Fund money, uh, African Development Bank money. Uh, they, they can be a substantial amount of money that can really bring things to scale. I think in the, in the past or ongoing, there's always been African Development Bank loans to agriculture programs, to nutrition programs, but sometimes the design teams haven't had the ability to integrate the best technologies. And the TAT mechanism and the clearinghouse that we support helps sort through some of the best technologies, the cutting edge technologies, uh, things like uh, semi-autotrophic hydroponic seed systems for cassava and saying how can these be considered for integration into those loan packages, into the projects that are funded by the African Development Bank and co-designed by the African Development Bank with assistance from the TAT mechanism. So I'm very optimistic about what it can do and what a contribution it can make to actually scale up some great technological breakthroughs. Thanks for that. And I mean, I do want to, you know, remind everyone that we'll be doing this, obviously, through our country programs, but the World Bank is also uh, working uh, side by side with us and also EFAD and others. So, and anyone else who wants to join, uh, please let us know, because I think there's certainly not a lack of country projects that can benefit from uh, these technologies. In a way, if you think about TAT, what it does is it almost like gets the technologies to the door and now we need to get them from the door of the clearinghouse to the farmers, so how do we do that? And I think that that's gonna be really the key, um, both ourselves and other institutions, and particularly the private sector. So uh, that's gonna be an interesting challenge. So, Mr. President, having heard all of this, and, and you know, you've been involved in this area for a long time, and, and you know, we were talking earlier about some of the challenges that you see, but based on what you've heard, from the different panelists and all of us working on this sort of challenging new effort, you know, what do you see as some of the things that'll really make this work? Uh, and in particular from the government perspective, but you know, I think we'd be interested to hear from a policy perspective what you think are, are the, the, really the role of the government here uh, to make this happen. What, what could other governments think about? And just in general, you know, your reactions to, to what's going on with this effort. Thank you very much. <clears throat> let, let, let me you start by uh, thanking the members of the panel and their different organizations for what they have done and what they are doing to change the face of uh, agriculture in Africa. And, um, and especially uh, what they have done in providing uh, funds for technology and um, for uh, the work like the one the uh, Rockefeller had done in uh, 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 fertilizer and uh, all the things that you have done and uh, Ruth for what you are doing with uh, uh, through Sasakawa um, Foundation. Um, I just want to emphasize the beginning of Sasakawa uh, work in Africa. When um, Sasakawa saw and read and saw it on television what happened in Ethiopia, and he was trying to find a solution. He phoned, he called on uh, Norman Bullock. And Norman Bullock said, no, don't worry me, I'm too old. <laughs> and of course, uh, Sazakawa was older than Norman, uh, Norman Bullock then. And Sazakawa said, what are you talking about? If I'm older than you and I still feel that I can be useful, then you have to be useful. That's how the two of them uh, came together with uh, uh, President Carter that had uh, um, uh, the wherewithal within Africa um, uh, to move on. And I was co-opted. Uh, that's how uh, 
uh, got in. Now, uh, what I want to say about technology and the way it's affecting or is going to affect the uh, Greek uh, production and food and all that in Africa is that already we have things that work and we have technology that is, can, can, can get us there. Now, what we have is we have transition now. And I will talk of transition in three areas. We have transition of new agribusiness rather than agricultural development program. Uh, that's one transition. Another transition is the transition from old farmers to new educated young farmers. For instance, talking of old farmers in my village, the youngest old farmer is my cousin who is 75 years old. <coughs> um, he, he didn't go to school uh, and right now he's too old. But the young ones, his own grandchildren who want to go in they will have to, how do we transition to them and make them the successor generation of farmers with education, with what they need uh, in terms of uh, inputs and facilities. Now, and this is where government comes in, 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 in every aspect of it. I believe that we have enough, of course, we can never stop and say, yes, we have reached the end of our research and technology, but we have enough to get us going. Um, DGIT has talked about cassava. Uh, uh, the representative of uh, Great Foundation has talked about, in fact, in cassava, the uh, preeminent, uh, pre Emergent um, um, herbicide, how much it can help. Now, how much of this technology is in the hand of the farmer? Now, we need to get more of it into the hands of the farmer. As Norman Bolog used to say, take it to the farmer. That is where it's needed, and we have to get it to the farmer. That's the first thing that the government has to help us to do. The second thing is there are facilities that the farmers need that government has to provide uh, or to help to provide. Now, <clears throat> I was with uh, IITA. Uh, the DG of IITA makes me an ambassador. The only thing is that they don't address me, His Excellency. Um, <clears throat> and what he, he does is he makes me do uh, things for IIT, which I, I really enjoy doing. The other day I went and they had about 120 uh, young boys and, and girls training to, in agripreneur, uh, uh, agripreneurship. Um, uh, and it's very interesting. And I ask them, how many of you have money when you leave here? 18 months. Um, the DG said it varies, but those that I met were doing 18 months course. Um, and only six out of 120 said that they have money to go and start something after their uh, 18 months training. How many of you have land? Only three of them said they have land out of 120. You can imagine the frustration of these young, uh, dynamic, and uh, vibrant uh, boys and girls, all of them in the age of uh, 20. Now, if they are discouraged, not only are, we, are they lost probably forever, 
in agriculture, they will get the story around, and many others will, that will have gone, gone in will, uh, will not go in. So what do they need? What land? Because whatever you do in agriculture, you need land. Even if you are going into aquaculture, you still need land. Uh, land, money for uh, startup, um, uh, and the DG of IIT, when we were talking earlier on, said, yes, there's a enable, uh, enabler. We need enabler, an enabler that government will have to provide so that this transition from old farmers to generation, uh, successful generation of educated, vibrant, young uh, uh, farmers um, can take place. Uh, and it is a matter of partnership. The government seeing itself as partner with those in agriculture, uh, not loading it to them. Because these young people know what they want, or any farmer, or no matter. Farmers, are, um, uh, we shouldn't uh, take anything for granted. They are, they are experienced and they are calculated. They are hard-headed calculators. They know about the season, they know about uh, their crop, and all they need is to help them. And um, the technology that is there must, of course, continue to be improved upon. But let us get what we have to the farmers, and then we are there. Absolutely. So not forgetting about the talent, because you can get all the technologies you want, but if you don't have the talented people who want to be on the farms, and if they don't have the land, uh, then they won't be able to do anything, and so the government can facilitate with that. Do we have a chance to ask people to? OK, so unfortunately, I think we don't have time to go to Q&A. However, I would like to give each of the panelists a moment, because that was a lot of information. Um, just if you could think about one thing that you would like this group to leave the room thinking about in terms of driving a technology revolution in Africa, in African agriculture, what would that be? One thing, given that we have almost no time left, I think we're already over time, but we'll take another minute or two because people have to get to the ceremony. Dr. Sengingo, what's the one thing? In a sentence or two. Yeah, the young people mm -hmm. involve them. Involve the young people. Mm -hmm. Roy? A, a system approach that really listens to the people we're trying to serve. System approach, Ruth? This help, helping these young people who are interested now, the new crop of farmers who are willing to take up the technologies, how do we enable them to actually move on and resources are required yeah, for that? I'd say enabling the private sector to play its essential role in, in scaling technologies and uh, linking that to serious government investment in agriculture and those enabling policies to allow dissemination to accelerate. Excellent. Mr. President? A great business should be taken as a business and there should be partnership between those who are in that business and the government. Okay, so when we think about technology, both the hard infrastructure and the soft infrastructure, let's not forget about the soft infrastructure, all that talent, all that business sense, and those great markets. Thanks, everybody. I wish you an excellent ceremony tonight. Thank you to the panel, and thank you to the organizers. I know it's been a long day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.